Well, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, back again. I was here two weeks ago. It's very unusual for me to do two things so close together. And I tell, I've been telling people I'm still sore from two weeks ago. Because um, as you know, I'm very demonstrative when I'm up here. And uh, so it takes time to recover, and I, ha I haven't quite recovered yet. But I'm back again. And my assigned topic today was missions, which I prefer a little more spe specificity, you know, like a text or something to start with. So this is a big topic, uh, but we're doing a, a mini missions emphasis here. So I'm going to try to uh, encapsulate this in a fairly short period of time this morning. But it's something that we do believe is important, and so we want to talk about what it actually is. Uh, so in the, in the series in Galatians, we've been looking at... Um, you know, a lot of things about how the gospel had already been presented in the Old Testament very early on. And in Galatians 3.8 in the series we just finished, it says that the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So the gospel beforehand is the phrase that is used there. So uh, the Apostle Paul's understanding was that Abraham had received the gospel, and that was that all nations would be blessed through his descendants, all peoples, Jew and Gentile. And so this morning, um, the topic or the title is called The Mission of God, and we're going to take a look at kind of how this um, theme flows through the whole Bible. Uh, this week, and during research, I was looking at uh, Christianity Today. And there was an article that, that summarized the state of, of Christianity here in the U.S. It was published on September 13th, so it's hot off the press. And here's what they said. They said the research, and this is Pew Research Form, indicates the current trend is inexorable. People are giving up on Christianity. They will continue to do so. And if you're trying to predict the future religious landscape in America, according to Pew, the question is not whether Christianity will decline it's how fast and how far. So in response to that, it does seem like a good time for us today to uh, look at what is God's mission in the world. And if you come here, you know, over a year or two period of time to, to TLC, you'll probably hear us talk about God's grand narrative in the Bible. And that narrative is that God has created all things. It's creation, right? He's created all things. He's created human being. Each person alive on the face of the earth is a special creation of God. Uh, we saw that our ancestors, the representative uh, man and woman, Adam and Eve, they had the experience of what we call the fall, where they chose to disobey God and set in motion a series of consequences that has affected the entire human race. Um, but then God began to work toward redemption, so he called Abraham. In that text we read earlier, it talked about that. Uh, so redemption came next, and then there is a future hope that we all expect as God closes history that there is a great future for people of faith. So um, we've gone through that process uh, a few times here. We talked through that entire narrative, and it's something to reinforce uh, so the big, mess, the big idea in this message today that I want us to consider is this. We will look at God's mission in the world to bless the nations. We're going to go around the world. We're going to go 4,000 years of history. We're going to talk about languages and geography. And we're going to compare the arrogance and self-reliance of people at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Compare that to the faith and obedience of Abraham. And then conclude with the implications for us today. What does the mission of God mean for us today? And I'm getting really nervous because that was a big deal. That sounded like there's no way he can do that. Uh, so we'll see what happens here. I'll do my very best. Three main ideas this morning. We see the fallenness of humanity in Genesis 11, 1 through 9. We see that people of all nations are objects of God's re redemption in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And then we see the Bible assumes that we are going to participate in God's mission as the people of God. So let's start with... Uh, a text that I love to read. It's the Tower of Babel. And let's see, in Genesis 11, here's what it says. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, 
Let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because the Lord scattered the, or confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, so the obvious thing that we see there is that if you're wondering why there are so many languages in the world, it begins right here at this incident. The word language occurs five times in the passage, and the word the, word the whole earth. So it is um, definitely tied to what we, we would consider the mission of God. So let's, let's see what happens here. And we might kind of summarize the idea here is that uh, man proposes, but God disposes. So they had an idea that they thought they wanted to do, but God did not allow it to happen. And so let's see what went wrong. So the first thing we see here is... Uh, we can see that the people refuse to fill the earth. In Genesis 9, it had just, we had just come through the flood, and you know, God chose Noah and his family to survive the flood and all the animals that went on the ark, and then they're told again, which was the original command to Adam and Eve, that they were to, to subdue the earth and fill it. They were to spread out over the entire earth. But we see here in the Tower of Babel incident that the people... Instead of doing that, instead of spreading out and filling the earth, instead of migrating all over, they decide they're going to build one tower and they're going to centralize there. They're going to build a, a city. And so rather than filling the earth, they decide to stay in one place. And Robert Alter, a Old Testament uh, Semitic language scholar, said, the polemic thrust of the story is against urbanism and the overweening confidence of humanity and the feats of technology. That sounds a little like us, right? Their new technology was bricks instead of stone, as you see in verse number three. They began to, they're using the latest technology, and they're going to do something to build a tower uh, into the heavens. And so they, they seem to have a bit of overconfidence in it. And there's also the element in the Bible, particularly in, in the, er, these original stories, uh, against urbanism or b the building of cities, right? The first murderer, Cain, goes off and he builds a city. And so there is, a, you know, a lot of people see sort of an anti-urban bias there. But we do know that, that God loves the cities, although they, d they do tend to be places where people can be anonymous and they can go and live there and, and do a lot of different things that they think maybe uh, they're not being noticed. Um, but God's noticing, right? And he, he sees and he comes down and looks around at what's going on. The people display arrogance in their attempt to make a name for themselves. Notice in verse number four, they say, so that we may make a name for ourselves. They want to build a big tower so that they can make a name for themselves. It's almost an attempt to be like God. And I believe all of you, as you go out and live your lives each day living in this area, you see that we are still building towers. In fact... What happened to the Empire State Building? It's just short now, right? You look, over, you look over the skyline, it's just, you know, it's here, and all these other buildings are, these little skinny buildings are towering over it. What happened? Was that, did that happen while the pandemic was going on? We were all staying home and not paying any attention. <laughs> it doesn't seem right. So people come to New York City, and they end up in our area, we're suburbanites of New York City. They come here, right? Many people come to make a name for themselves. The arts, business, sports. I was just thinking I like the Jets, and by the time that we have our football thing, they'll be already out of it. <laughs> so I'm going to have to, you know, embrace another team. I can feel it coming already. But we see in 
The New York City metropolitan area, many people, they left a conservative rural background, right, in the, maybe in the Midwest or some other part of the country, and they said, I'm going to go to New York City. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to, you know, pursue a career. I'm not going to have this oppressive, you know, restrictions that I have where I grew up at in this conservative Midwestern town or whatever, and they come here to rebel. They come here to live their life without any constraints, make a name for themselves. This is an old story, folks. It's right here at the Tower of Babel. But then it says that God responds. And what's he do? He responds by frustrating their efforts to rebel. It says, come, let us go down and confuse their languages so they can't understand each other. So has God ever frustrated your efforts to live your life the way that you wanted to live? And here we see that language, the various languages, is, was not meant to be a blessing. It was a form of judgment. So they couldn't communicate with each other. So if this hadn't, wouldn't happen, we would, we would all understand each other perfectly well. Be no accents, no confusing languages. Language is a form of judgment. And so in the Old Testament... When the Israelites went into exile, when they heard a foreign language, that meant they had been captured by enemies and relocated to a different place. It was a sign of judgment on them when they heard the foreign language. Now, there's a quote I like a lot about language, and here it is. It's, it's actually apparently a Spanish proverb, and I'd like to talk to you uh, Spanish-speaking people after this to find out where this came from. But it says, Spanish is a language for lovers, Italian for singers, French for diplomats, German for horses, and English for geese. <laughs> what is that all about? <laughs> English for geese. And Spanish for lovers. Albert. <laughs> Um, now, the only way I can hit back on this one is I, I do have this I, a no, curious thing I've noticed about um, Spanish-speaking peoples, and that is that they seem to tend to name their, some of their sons Jesus, right, Jesus, which I thought, why would you do that to someone who <laughs> can only underachieve his whole life? There's no way. <laughs> There's Jesus again, messing up. So I've never understood that. But we do see the fallenness of humanity here at the Tower of Babel. And the, and the languages, whether what, whatever your ear is attuned to, whichever language your ears are attuned to, um, we see the fallenness of humanity, but we also see not long after this God's plan to bless the nation. So let's look at that. Uh, in Genesis 12, 1 through 4, look at what happens. God calls Abraham to bless the nations. It says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So we see here that the plan of God was always to bless all nations, not just Abraham or Israel. It says in verse 3, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Israel, so if you're Jewish, right, you're, you're the chosen people, but you're not the only chosen people because we see here that God chose the Jewish people to reach out and bless the nations, right? To live a separate way so that all nations would become envious of them, right? And want to be like that. Um, and we see here that Abraham is told, and I'm going to quote from the, the African Bible commentary. It says he was, he was to leave three things, his country, his people, and his father's household. These are the very things that give anyone a sense of security, but Abram is told to leave them. So he leaves 
the, sense, the security that he has, and he's told to go to, and he does it. He leaves and goes. And so through Abraham's obedience, God promises to make his name great, which is the, what the people at the Tower of Babel wanted. They wanted to make a great name for themselves. So Abraham, by obeying God, God makes his name great. The people who sought a great name didn't end up with a great name. So God's economy, it works upside down. And we see here that Abram went, setting himself apart from the people at Babel who were supposed to scatter, but they tried to stay in one place and build a big tower. But Abraham went uh, listening to God. So in this text, we see the gospel beforehand. We see God's mission in this world has always been to bless all nations through the seed of Abraham. Now, did anyone else you know, in Israel understand this? Yes, David understood this. He said in Psalm twenty-two, twenty-seven, 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. So David understood this. Solomon understood this when he dedicated the temple. Listen to how he prayed. He prayed, as for the foreigner who does not belong to your people, Israel, but has come from a great distant land because of your name, for they will hear of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm when they come and pray toward this temple then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. So David understood this uh, that was God's mission. Solomon understood it. And then a later writer of the Psalm 67 said this prayer that I, I love to recite on a as, as a mission's emphasis, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. So there is this theme that goes through the Hebrew Bible, you know, which we, we think often it was just all about the Jewish people, but it wasn't ever intended to be just all about the Jewish people because God was a, intending for them to be a blessing to all nations. So we've looked at how uh, we see the fallenness of humanity in the Tower of Babel. We see that all people are objects of redemption in the calling of Abraham. And now let's look for uh, some, some implications for us today. The Bible assumes our participation in God's mission in the world. Now, if we were to talk about how we, you know, what text we think about when we think about missions, we would probably say Matthew 28, 19, and 20, right? We call it the Great Commission. It's in the New Testament. It's the one that we focus on uh, the most. So let me read that. It says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the ends of the age. Now, uh, you know, going back to, in, in English, you know, the language for geese, we said, <laughs> this verse sounds like a command, right? An imperative. We call it in the, gram grammatically, an imperative, where we command someone to do something. But if we look at the original language of this verse, it's not uh, a command. It's actually an aorist participle, which has the force of an assumption. So if we were to translate this you know, in a way that I think reflects the idea that's uh, inherent in the, in, the, um, in the grammar, we would say, as you go, make disciples of all nations. So the assumption is that we're all going to be participating in it. It's, it's not just that, you know, I live my life and then God zaps me and I've got the calling and then I say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to leave my home and everyone, I'm going to go across the world. We're going to talk about how that all works, but that's really not the idea. The idea is that Jesus is saying, as you are going, make disciples of all nations, all of them. So that's a di little different way of looking at it. So God invites us all to participate in his mission. And in the last two years in the church, we did a series on the kingdom of God, and we said in that that we are all priests, right? We're all intermediaries on God's behalf to the world, to the nations. Christopher J. H. Wright is an um, Old Testament scholar, and he worked with John Stott in, uh, in the UK and took over a ministry that John Stott started. And John Stott 
was an Anglican evangelical, and he started a ministry to provide theological resources to uh, people in the global south because Christianity was growing in the global south, Africa, uh, Asia, Latin America. He was providing resources because there wasn't a lot of resources for theological training. And Christopher J. H. Wright took over this ministry after John Stott died, and he's thought a lot about uh, missions. And in, in the UK, in Europe, they use the term mission where we use the term missions. And I kind of like mission because it's kind of direct and focused, right? It's very, it seems to be focused on a mission. And here's what he says about uh, how he would define mission. He says, our mission means our committed participation as God's people at God's invitation and command in God's own mission within the history of God's world for the redemption of God's creation. And so our mission flows from and participates in God's mission. So we don't need to you know, sit around in a, in a conference room and say, what's our mission? It's already pretty well been laid out for us. We just need to participate. We need to engage in it. Now, our typical understanding of missions here in our country, I would say in, the, in the North America, is that God sets some people apart through a special call to service, and they go, right? And we enable them to go. We give money to them. We pray for them. And that's absolutely one model that is biblical because we see here in, in Acts 13, 2, it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And they went off to reach unreached people in the world at that time. So we see a calling and a sending out of missionaries, the, you know, the, the earliest missionaries. Um, but that's not the only way of looking at it, and I'm going to sort of hopefully expand our horizons on this here in the next few minutes. So missions looks very different than it did 100 years ago. Um, 100 years ago, 75 years ago, it pretty much was like this. Um, there was an implicit understanding that missionaries came from the West, and the recipients of missionaries were living elsewhere. So all of the missionaries came from North America or Europe. Often the majority of them were white. And you know we can get into colonialism and all that kind of stuff and all of that, but that was kind of the model that happened. But a strange thing happened in the last hundred years. And uh, I think there's a slide, the next slide goes to that. And what happened is the center of Christianity shifted right beneath our feet. And we may not have been aware of it, uh, but many of you are aware of it because you are a, you know, you're a result of that. So the center of Christianity has shifted from the global north, which is Europe and North America, to the global south, which is Latin America, Sub-Sahara Africa, and Asia Pacific. So if you look at the statistics there, in 1910, 82% of Christians, people who identified as Christian in the world, lived in North America or Europe. 82%. The entire rest of the world had 18% of the world's Christians. Fast forward 60 years, 1970, it goes up to 57 and 43. 57% of the Christians were in North, global north, 43% in the global south. 2018, look at how it's changed. 34% of Christians are now in the global north, 66% in the global south. So what that means is that Christianity is flourishing, and we can go to the next slide, for this. Christianity is flourishing in Latin America, Africa. It's growing in Asia, although it's still a very minority part, and Oceania. So Christianity is growing, and Africa, the continent of Africa, has the most Christians in the world. So we are not the center in North America anymore. Europe, the West, is not the center of Christianity anymore. And that's going to have profound impact on how things uh, develop as we go forward. I think the best way to capture what has happened is a quote from Philip Yancey, and here's what he says. And i got to go to there. As I travel, I have observed a pattern, a strange historical phenomenon of God moving geographically from the Middle East to Europe to North America 
and to the developing world. My theory is this. God goes where he's wanted. And I showed you where God is wanted on that map. Things are changing. So today, missions is not just people from the West going to the rest of the world. Today, missions is from anywhere to anywhere. It's from anywhere to anywhere. Harvey Kuyani is a Malawian missionary educator and practitioner teaching African theology at the Liverpool Hope University in the UK. He was a pastor in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. For a time, he had an African congregation that rented, that their church rented a building from a Lutheran church. And in one of the interviews in a podcast, he notes uh, that it is much easier for a person to go on a missions trip because he says people will accommodate you and it doesn't require you to change as much as it requires when you have a building, right? You're a, a church renting to a building of Africans, right, to engage with them. Because he said that requires you to change your behavior and, and, and your outlook on things when you do that. And he said there was very little communication between his congregation and the, the congregation that they rented the building from, but yet those people would send people to other parts of the world and they would go engage in missions in that way. As you go. Here's what Harvey Kuyani said. In addition to European and North American missionaries, God calls people of any race and continent to participate in God's mission in the world today. Indeed, a missionary in our day and age can be anybody. A Malawian domestic worker in Dubai, a Korean student in London, a Brazilian businessman in Mozambique, a Nigerian cattle herder in Burkina Faso, or indeed a Mexican pastor in Chicago. God call, God's call to mission invites all Christians to participate. Mission itself must become a multi-centered phenomenon. So how does it work? Here's a few ways it works. Migration. Migration. It's a way that God sends missionaries. Now, how many of you came here from another country and live here now? Can you raise your hand if you would? Because there's a lot of people in the congregation. So I would offer that you may have been sent here. (laughs) You thought you were orchestrating the whole thing yourself. But God through migration. And Philip Jenkins wrote a book called The Next Christendom, and he talks about all of these trends that I'm talking about. And he says migration is the primary way that mission works. People migrate, and they don't leave their faith at home, in the home country. They bring it with them. And they're more open to it in the new country, probably than they even were in the old country. So job transfers is one way that people get sent as missionaries. Being educated in another part of the world. People come to the United States for education. They, they go to other places in the world for education. They are on mission when they do that. Immigration, both legal and illegal immigration, is a way that people move from one place in the world to another. So we could end up here in Bergen County with the next bus of migrants from Texas because they're sending them all over the country now right, to kind of disperse the responsibility. So since God has always had a mission, the Bible should be read with a view towards development of the theme of God's promise to bless the nations through the promised seed. It is as Christian believers recognize God's mission that they may purpose to participate in fulfilling that mission. So I'm saying that God doesn't just call people and then send them to another country in a religious sense, but he also moves people through migration. He uses a number of different methods, and he's bringing people here. He's bringing people to other parts in the world to participate in his mission. Last time I preached two weeks ago, I talked about circumcision, which is an uncomfortable topic, and I have another one to bring up. It is another way that um, missions works as well and that is fertility. So one of the ways that um, people who study missions look at where Christianity is flourishing is they look at fertility rates because they've found out something. 
Religious people have more children than non-religious people. It's just the truth. Women who attend religious services weekly in the United States average 2.4 children per family. Muslim women average 2.7 children. That's in the United States. Women who attend religious services less than weekly average 1.8 children per family. And non-religious women worldwide average 1.4 children. So religious people, you know, Christian and Muslims have more children than non-religious secular people do. So that is a way that Christianity spreads. It's a way that Islam is spreading as well. The Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Christian denomination in the United States, about 16 million people, and they realized recently that they're losing about half of their young people that grow up in their churches leave. So 50%. Um, so this makes us aware, realize, in my mind, that we also, as part of our mission, need to make sure that we're taking care of our children as we're raising them up in the faith. Through Christian education, which I'm glad to see is beginning to resurface here, children's ministries, and then the other thing that we need to invest in is affordable ministerial training here in, the, in North America. The average age of ministers is upper 50s, so Pastor Jim, me, Albert's right nipping at our heels there. <laughs> or getting older, pastors are getting older. And there's not, very, there's not enough of a supply to replace them because ministerial education is very expensive. You know, college tuition is very expensive. So you can't have a lot of debt and be a pastor because you don't make the income typically to survive in that situation. So these are things that are part of the mission that we have from God that we need to look at. Migration, fertility, raising up our children, anywhere to anywhere. This is what God is doing in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission, God's mission. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. So we've seen the fallenness of humanity in the Tower of Babel incident and how the people were to migrate, they were to spread out across the world and they refused to do that. They wanted to stay put and create this tower that extended into the heavens. We see Abraham's call was to bless all the nations. And now in, in our day, we see how God is blessing all the nations through these various means we've talked about. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the culmination of God's mission in the world to bless the nations. And it's been, uh, God's been on that mission for over 4,000 years. And today God invites and commands all of us to participate in his mission within the history of this world for the redemption of his creation. This is what God is doing. This is God's mission. So the question I have for you today is, are you on mission for God? Are you on mission for God? Are you participating in God's mission in the world? This is what he's doing, and I believe that it's the best option for us is just to join in what he is already doing. I hope you will say yes this morning to the mission of God. Let's pray. Lord, we see that you are working around the world and you are turning our old assumptions upside down in the way that Christianity is moving across this globe. And Lord, we thank you for the people that you've sent from other places into our midst. May they renew us. May they inspire us. May we make room for their gifts and ministries and Lord, help us to see what you're doing more clearly. And I pray for each person here that in their, in their coming and going each day, that they will look for specific ways to bless the nations, 
to bless all peoples. Lord, we thank you for reminding us this message to us today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.